Again, we've had some new people come in the room, so thank you all for being here. We're very excited right now. Diane, we'll get started in just a minute. Um, we're excited to have Karen with us today. And we're going to ask everyone um, that because of her compromised immune system that we not do handshakes and kisses and hugs. You can blow kisses to Karen and she will take pictures afterwards with everyone. Um, but we want to support her in this very practical way. So if you all could help with that, it would be wonderful. And we're going to turn it over to Diane. Nope. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Very happy to see you back again. And I'm especially happy to see my beloved friend, Karen Lewis. Yeah, let's keep the makeup intact. <laughs> You'll make me cry. Thank you. Well, the first thing I have to say about Karen is she looks absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> but I would not recommend her diet plan. <laughs> Uh, I have to just tell you about when I first met Karen. Uh, a few years ago, I was uh, going out and, and talking about the book that I wrote in 2010 called The Death and Life of the Great American School System, and I was speaking in Detroit. And I was supposed to go from Detroit to Los Angeles, but I had met Mike Klonsky, and Mike said, you know, I can introduce you to Karen Lewis. And I said, oh, I'd love to meet Karen Lewis. And so I got into, he gave me her email and I, and I said, uh, I'll do a layover in Chicago and I'll make sure that there's like an hour and a half where we can talk. And Karen said, an hour and a half? That's not enough time. <laughs> so I made the layover for four hours and Karen and her husband, John, met me at the airport. We went to a room in a nearby hotel and we talked for four hours as though we'd known each other all our lives. And that's the kind of person this woman is. She's amazing. She is such a people person, and she has a heart that is just uh, unbelievable. And I, I, I dearly love her. Thank you, Diane. So wait, wait. Can I add one more thing to that? Sure. I just want to. I just want to set the record straight. She offered to send me her book. And I told her I didn't want that because I already had it and I had annotated it and all these other things, but I did want her to sign it for me. So the feeling was mutual. I was totally excited to meet Diane Ravage and the fact that she wanted to meet me and all I had done was win an election. That's it. I hadn't done anything. So I was, well, not in 2010, but anyway, so thank you. So in, in getting ready to talk about her, I, I went to the web and I thought, is there something I, I don't know about her? Because I spent all these hours talking and we've emailed over these last few years. And I thought I knew everything to know. Of course, you never know everything about anybody. But I went to Wikipedia and I learned that, I, I knew that Karen had gone to this uh, wonderful Ivy League school from the Chicago Public School. She went to Mount Holyoke. She then graduated from Dartmouth. And what I loved about the fact that she graduated from Dartmouth was when these hedge fund guys would try to impress her, she would say to them, listen, Buster, I wore the green coat too. That's what you get at Dartmouth. <laughs> and you know, Karen's not shy. <laughs> so what I learned about her from Wikipedia was she majored in sociology and music. Now, this is an educated woman who knows what real education is, and this is what she wants for the children of Chicago. And unlike some people who are in power in this city, she wants them for all the children. Yeah. And I learned something else from Wikipedia that I didn't know about Karen. When she won the election and took office, she and the leadership of the CTU cut the union salaries. 
so that they could spend more organizing and going out into communities and bringing in parents and creating a new paradigm of union, social justice unionism. So what made Karen a national figure was the fact that she led the strike in September of 2012. was so not led by me. I'm sorry. Everybody said Karen Lewis led the strike. I was stuck in a hotel room. So no, that, 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 the, the strike of 2012 was an amazing feat of rank and file members saying they'd had enough and they wanted some respect. That's what that was. That was not me. I was nowhere near it. I missed all the good stuff. Yeah. Right, we saw all those thousands and thousands of members out in the streets in their red t-shirts. We were all so inspired. And I know that on the national media, the national media were saying, oh, isn't it terrible that he, teachers went on strike? They don't care about the kids. And meanwhile, what was, the, what was happening in Chicago while the national media was bashing you and Fox News was bashing you? The, the parents were behind us so much. I mean, it was like so different. I mean, the media, the national media, and even our local media were using tired old tropes. Nobody likes a teacher strike because, you know, it's inconvenient for parents, which allows them to also think of us as babysitters. You know, which is one of the reasons why teachers having the right to strike is absolutely important. Because we have to defend our, our now, kids the best way we can. So Karen, we just had a discussion with Randy and Lily about the future of teacher unionism. And um, I'm, I'm trying to ask hard questions. So this is a hard question. Do you think there should be a national teacher strike? Um, I, I, this, is, this is what keeps me hopeful, is that we went on strike and we got spanked for it, okay? Let's, let's not forget we, did, we got spanked. You know, close 50 schools, you know, blah, blah, blah. We're going to get spanked this year. We're going to get spanked next year because we stood up. So I want people to walk into this not be romanticizing what we did. Because I think that's something that I run into when I run into people on the street and they come smile at me, or if I go some, especially if I go someplace else. And it freaks me out that people recognize me. You know, and I'm like, what? You know, I'm in Miami, you know. So, um, but the problem is, We need to spend so much time organizing each other because there's so many people that are nowhere near ready for that. Exactly. And, and it's too serious a move to do and to undertake without tons and tons of preparation. So, you know, 2020 maybe, you know? I mean, but that's what it would take. I mean, we shouldn't, we shouldn't have any uh, uh, delusions about it. But I also think that it would take um, the, the national leadership to not only support, but encourage. And, um, and along the way, us involving our communities and our parents in our work on a daily basis is what gives you that kind of opportunity. So you're in a state now where things are looking very grim. You've got Bruce Rauner, who's one of the worst enemies of public education as governor. Also um, went to Dartmouth. Uh -huh. 
isn't it embarrassing that you both wear the same green jacket? <laughs> but I just wear the t-shirts and the, and the shorts. I don't really okay. wear the jacket. <laughs> so you've got Bruce Rauner as governor. You've got four more years of Mayor Emanuel. How can you feel hope? How can you give hope to your members and to parents and to the community about the future of Chicago public schools? Well, I think the first thing you have to do and the first thing we all do is spend time educating folks and letting them know how toxic this environment is about to be and it's gonna get worse, especially with a governor who has specifically said he wants our heads on the chopping block. And he's going to do things. I mean, the key is that we have to be ready on so many different levels. And what happened, I think, to public schools and unions all over the country, we weren't ready for the attack. And they had been planning it for a very long time, and we were not ready for it. So by the time 2010 comes around, and the attack is getting more vicious and more vicious, but if you notice, in the mayor's race, he didn't attack us. He did not attack us at all, because that didn't work for him. It worked for him in 2011, when I think that was their absolute, uh, I should say nadir, uh, not apex, but their, their strongest attack. You have stand on children. You have what Jonah <laughs> Edelman still, Still pu pu pushing this, this um, what do you call it? Just this, this you, you have a name for it, Diane. Not, you mean the corporate reform? No, stuff? but you have another name for it, like scam something, it's snake a oil. It's a great it's hoax. It's a hoax, right. And the thing that I noticed, too, is that the charter people have had to look for another direction to go because they could talk about how fabulous their schools were as long as they didn't have to take the tests. You know, once they had to take the test, oh, day of reckoning. Gee, they're not doing any better. As a matter of fact, they do worse than normal neighborhood schools. Mm -hmm. So knowing that, the key is to always find what is the lever that will move them off of us and have them having to spend their PR money doing something else, you know? Well, um, I, I, I've told you this story, and, and I was questioned about it during the mayoral campaign, uh, but a couple of years ago, I was in Chicago, and uh, there's a woman in Chicago who gives out an annual award for people who are good, in, good to schools, and this is Dolores Cole. So I was getting the Dolores Cole Award, then afterwards she had a small dinner, and there were about a dozen people, and I was sitting across from Bruce Rauner, who, and I had no idea he was going to run for governor. And we began having a heated discussion about charter schools, because the Noble Network, which he's part of, names schools for individual rich people. And so there's a Bruce Rauner charter school, there's a Penny Prisker charter school, and I don't know all the other rich people in Chicago, but they all have their own names on a school. And so I said, do you think it's right that your school doesn't accept kids with disabilities? He said, why should we? And I said, well, what about the kids who are English language learners? And he said, those kids are not my problem. He said, I want the kids who are going to succeed. I want the kids who are motivated. I want the kids who will be successful. I don't want the, those kids. And I said, well, what are we supposed to do with them? He said, I don't know, it's not my problem. That's the governor of Illinois. It is, it is truly shameful. And um, so I think the issue, Karen, for you and, and for many people who care about this struggle, and I have to say, back up a second and say, you're one of the few people who very quickly understood what the dimensions of the struggle are. The fact that there is a coordinated campaign uh, that there's all this money behind it, that they all use the same language. I mean, whether you're in Louisiana or Texas or California or New York or any state in the country, somebody will say, we want to create a privately managed school to save poor children from failing public schools. We don't want their zip code to be their destiny, and that's why we have to close the public school and open a privately managed school. 
And then when you find out that the privately managed school doesn't get different results or actually gets worse results, they don't close their school, but they've already closed yours. And, but the thing that always has amazed me is the vocabulary, the language, the phrases that I hear everywhere that are the same. And it makes me, I have this imagine, imagination or vision that somewhere about 2006 or seven, a group of very wealthy people sat around a, peop, a, a table, maybe, or just sent their representatives, and they hired the most expensive PR firm in the country. And they said, how do we message our campaign? Well, the first thing you have to do is call yourselves reformers. That's a great word in the vocabulary. Uh, but we want to get rid of the public schools. How can we be reform? No, no, you're going to call yourself reformers. That really appeals to the public. And you're going to say, let's close failing schools. Let's fire bad teachers. Who's going to defend bad teachers? And there are just a whole, there's a long list of words and phrases that are echoed around the country, and it's the same songbook. They are all singing the same song, and boy, would I love to get a copy of that songbook. Uh, although I think we sort of know it, because whether you live in New York or Chicago or Los Angeles, we've heard the, the, the words, and, uh, but we get some victories. That's what's so exciting. You didn't win here, but you might win the next time. Right, um, I mean, and, and here's, Here's what's most important about electoral politics. We're never going to win the money battle, okay? We're never going to win the money battle. But it's so interesting that Bruce Rauner wants to shut our voice, since Citizen United is free speech, wants to shut our voice so he can just clear the airwaves. Right now, there's a very interesting commercial on television. And it's about the environment and how we should keep the nuclear plants open. I don't know if you've seen this commercial yet, but I've been noticing it. And, and it goes on and on and on. And at the very end, it says, tell, no, it says, lawmakers, uh, uh, general assembly members, vote to keep open nuclear. Why are you buying a commercial? to the lawmakers who you already have lobbied and given a whole lot of money to. That's to get the public behind your thing. And that's the next, that's the next wave. We're gonna see, we saw a few of the ugly commercials uh, in 2011, but they're gonna ramp up. They're gonna get bigger and uglier. And the more we network and the more we provide resources to one another and help one another, the, the more money they're going to spend buying the airwaves. Well, you're right that we'll never win the money battle because it's amazing. I, I, someone, I guess a year or two ago, there was a list of like the 10 richest people in America, and nine of them were in the school reform movement, and they weren't on our side. Mm -hmm. And you wonder, why do they bother? I mean, reporters always say, oh, you're just talking conspiracy theory. Why would Bill Gates and Eli Broad, they don't want to make money off school reform. And it's true, they don't want to make money. Bill Gates has more money than he could spend in 10 lifetimes. But what they do believe in is the free market. They're free market fundamentalists. And they believe that... Uh, Chicago school. <laughs> yeah. That's where it comes from, right here. Right, it's Milton Friedman. And, and we can see you know, the effect of Milton Friedman thinking in Chile, in Chile where they, the schools are terrible. Uh, mm -hmm. The rich get great schools, the poor get nothing or horrible schools. There's more racial segregation, social segregation, economic segregation, and a reform party recently won the elections in Chile after massive student protest, demanding some kind of egalitarianism in the education system. And uh, the government is trying to figure out how to unwind this. Once you have given away your public system, it's very hard to get it back again. And this is why we have to stop it now. I agree, I agree. And I, I would also venture to say that the tremendous, uh, you know, I saw this meme running around, you know, if, 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 if we don't need unions anymore, then why are the richest people in the world trying to get rid of them?
Well, I know that we could go on talking with Karen all day. I certainly could. Um, She's a personal hero of mine. I know uh, a few years ago I used to get in these tremendous Twitter battles because if I said anything on my blog that offended someone from Teach for America or the Ed Reform Movement, they would just come in like, they, they would swarm me on Twitter. And Karen would be lurking in the background and would come in and support me. Uh, and I thought, well, that's pretty cool to have the head of the CTU on your side. Uh, I wanna just say, cause I, know, I don't wanna tax her, I know she's, uh, she's a hero to all of us. She's a hero to me. She's given us courage. She's given us inspiration. She's shown all of us what people can do when they work together. I mean, we often talk about, I often talk about how one individual can change the world. But what Karen has understood is that in unity there's power and that the way to beat the money power is with people power. There are so many of us and so few of them. I don't think they could fill this room unless they sent all their assistants in. <laughs> but uh, she has shown gr grit, real grit, perseverance. She's shown respect, respect for her members, respect for the children, respect for the parents, respect for the community. And um, she has this tremendous intellect that she's put in the service of children. So thank God for Karen Lewis, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you guys, you guys. down. Thank you. <laughs> you know, that makes me just so crazy. And, and, you know, it's like, oh my God, Diane Ravage is saying all these things about me when I was thinking that about you. Um, and it's, it's amazing to see so many people interested in doing the right thing. You know, I think that is the one thing that used to bother me. And when our members would say, well, our stories are never told, you know. And our stories were being told, they just weren't being picked up by mainstream media. And I like the fact that we've done some amazing stuff on social media. Uh, I want to point out Michelle Gunderson, who's been one of our... The Twitter queen. I thought I saw Sean Barrett come in, Francisco Barrett. He came in. Jose Luis. Jose Luis. Another one. Social media. Thank you. I remember I got attacked one one night, and the Twitter bats came and helped me. Are there any? Are there any bats? Did you all bring, bring t-shirts and stuff? Because I want one. Um, <laughs> but there's so many people that have been involved in making this. And again, you can't do put all your apples in one basket. It can't only be about the the world of politics. It can't only be about the world of rich folks, and it can't only be about the world of poverty. You know, It's about defining what poverty does to children and what it does to communities, and not stepping back from it, and continuing to push forward the narrative, because that's what they do. They say the same eight things over and over again. <laughs> This, yeah. And just what Diane said, they say the same eight things. They have their little bullet point. Well, we need ours. Before, I always felt we were so busy trying to explain everything to people, because we're teachers. So we want to explain things, right? And I got to the point where I learned very quickly, don't explain, just hit your, hit your points. And then if somebody asks for clarification, go into that then, but don't do that. Just Fill your words with truths that we know. 
So, thank you. Okay, well, I want to, uh, not only to thank you all for being here, these are concluding remarks, uh, but I have, to tell, I have to tell Karen why I will never, ever forget the Chicago strike of 2012. Um, I'm a technological idiot. And you may not know that, but because my blog started three years ago Monday on April 26th. And Bravo. It's, it is right now, it's right now, is today? Okay, today. is it 19 million 600,000 page views? And it, as you know, I, I try to use the blog to give other people voice, especially parents and teachers. Most of the things that appear there are not written by me, I just write the introduction, because I want people to hear what's happening around the country and, and to hear the voices of people in the classroom, to hear the voices of people in the communities. And um, if you should want to like open the blog 40 times today, it's okay with me. I might reach 20 million on this day. Um, <laughs> I don't even know what day it is. That's how good I am technologically. But the reason that I'll always remember the strike is because being technologically inept, I don't know how to get into my own blog. And I discovered early on that if I pressed a button that said, uh, like, it, it, if anybody has links, then I get to moderate the comment. And so one of the moderate the comments came from somebody who was on strike in Chicago in 2012. Since then, I have stopped do doing that on my home email because I was getting like 500 emails a day and I couldn't find any of the personal messages. Uh, so I never see anything anymore uh, from the blog until I go to the blog, but how do I get to the blog? <laughs> I go to my Gmail and I put in the word moderate and I come to something that says, David Hunley of the CTU has a comment on his post why I am on strike. And I press that and it opens up my blog. <laughs> I, I have no idea who David Hunley is. All I can tell you is thank you, David, for letting me have access to my blog. So, you know, it's always wonderful when you see signs of hope and they, they are around us. I, to me, the most hopeful thing that's happened in a very long time is the massive opt-out in New York State. And for days, the New York Times wouldn't even report that it happened. And the first article they wrote was, teachers unions are finding a way to become relevant again. They've created an opt-out. Well, teachers unions didn't do it. Yeah. Parents did it. Parents. And I'm still waiting for a story in the New York Times to explain why 200,000 parents are following the orders of the teachers union. They don't do it. It was parents saying enough is enough. And somehow the parents got the message. And it wasn't just somehow. Their parent leadership in New York State is very strong. And they don't want their children to get a low score on a test that's designed to fail them, where 70% failed for the last few years, and then to have their teacher punished because of their children's test score. The whole system is ridiculous, and parents are smart, and they understand that. And so... So in addition to the opt-out, we get this article, the most recent article from Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times, who sometimes writes really good columns, except Boy. when he writes about education. <laughs> On education, he thinks that you know, reform is wonderful. He wrote the other day, despite the fact that we've spent more than a dozen years trying to reform our schools, it's not working. We. I don't remember him being in the schools. <laughs> but he said, despite the efforts of idealistic billionaires, it's not working. I thought that was terrific. It's not working, he said. So we should focus on early childhood. Well, I think it's fine to focus on early childhood unless they decide that what the children who are one need is to learn how to read before they're two, <laughs> which might be the case. But here's the deal is you cannot fail and fail and fail and succeed. So his judgment recommends 
says to me that the conversation in these little closed uh, boardrooms is it's not working. Nothing that we do has succeeded. The charters are not taking over. The vouchers are not taking over. They're doing worse than the public schools. And merit pay is rejected. And, and, when, and, and teacher ba test based teacher evaluation is failing because it doesn't work either. Nothing they do works. And you can't uh, fail your way to success. So clearly, what we need to do is to make alliances, and the three most important groups that I think we need to rely on are the ones that, are, that can't be fired, the ones who can't be intimidated. Number one, the parents. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> parents cannot be fired. Right. Right. And grandparents. Then you could be banned. <laughs> no. You can be banned from school board meetings. And, and grandparents, I'm a grandparent of a public school student. I wrote a piece blog today about my grandson who opted out last week. And this is when I understood that the tide was turning. Last year when he was in second grade, you have to understand, my eight-year-old, now eight-year-old grandson is totally brilliant. He's so much smarter than anyone else I know. <laughs> last year I said to him, you know, next year is going to be the testing year. Are you going to take the test? He said, I love to take tests. I'm going to take the test. And I thought, oh, you what an embarrassment. <laughs> and then this year, he's a year older. He's a year smarter. I, and I said to him with no prompting and, and, and no preconditions, I said, uh, Elijah, are you planning to take the test? He said, oh, no, I'm opting out. <laughs> okay. So, and I, I wrote this in the blog. I said, but Elijah, why? Why are you? Why did you change your mind? Why are you opting out? And he said, Well, first of all, we spent a lot of time learning to bubble in. And he said, I, I know so much more than the questions they ask. They're not going to find out what I know by having me make bubbles. And if you make the wrong, if you make too much of a bubble or too little of a bubble, they say you're wrong. That's not a test of what I know. And then he said, the second reason is. It's not fair to, and he literally used this word, it's not fair to evaluate my teacher based on how I answer questions. <laughs> so. Out of the mouths of babies. And, and he doesn't read my blog. <laughs> so that's the first group is parents, grandparents. The second group is students, especially high school students. <laughs> What so impressed me is that the high school students are usually so much smarter than the grown-ups. Because they know that writing a petition is not going to change anyone's mind. Signing a letter doesn't change anyone's mind. They do street action. I mean, those kids from the Newark Student Union, eight kids. I see the president of the, uh, the Newark Student Union's arm is uh, no longer broken. <laughs> Congratulations. He, there eight, eight students sat in in the superintendent's office and brought international attention to the cause and closed down the superintendent's office and they had to negotiate with them and they have more work to do. I mean, I could tell you stories about the Providence Student Unions, the Union, and, and they, again, high school students who spoke out against using a standardized test for high school graduation, and they won. Mm -hmm. And again, they didn't do it by petitions, they did it by action. They did it by, it wasn't sit-downs, they did all kinds of de demonstrations. They uh, uh, ran through the legislature dressed as guinea pigs. They marched in front of the State Department of Education dressed as zombies with ketchup running down their faces on onto their shirts. I mean, they just did action after action. And the truth was, they were right. They had the psychometric evidence with them and the state superintendent eventually. They, first, they went over the legislature. And uh, then they 
state superintendent. It's no longer the state superintendent. She's a superintendent of Tulsa, which is, you know, it's not a demotion, but she ain't there anymore. Yeah, it is. So there's a third group that can help and should help, and that's retired educators. So there are three groups that can be outspoken and that cannot be fired, and we have to bring them into the struggle, uh, and uh, I think we're going to win. So important thing to know is they want us to give up. They want teachers to quit so they can be replaced by young kids who will come and go, who will never accumulate any seniority, who will never have high salaries, who will never have a pension. That's the business model. Bring the price down. Bring the cost down. Don't quit. Don't give up. Stay there. So we have to have our credo. We will fight for the students. We will fight for better education for all students. We will fight to strengthen the education and not to let them destroy it, because that's what they want to do. We will not quit. We will prevail. And we will be here after the millionaires and the billionaires have found another hobby. <laughs> We, when they're gone, and they will go, because it's getting boring to keep losing, we will still be here. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. You look great. Oh, yeah. oh, that was wonderful. Thank you. Don't, don't go. I, I almost forgot the most important thing to tell you is we have a call to action. Last year we called for congressional hearings on testing, and I think that we've helped move that discussion along. This year we have three things we want to uh, have as our call to action. Number one, do whatever you can to support the tester amendment. I know that it's very curiously named, but there's actually a congressman, Tester, who is opposed to testing. <laughs> The tester amendment would replace annual testing in federal law with grade span testing. It would be our preference to have no federal law for testing, but let's go for grade span rather than annual testing. Support the tester amendment. <laughs> Secondly, we want to encourage, we will, first of all, we want to support all those parents or teachers who choose to opt out. And secondly, to not only to support them, but to encourage them to opt out. Yep. This, this is a moment where we say, you know that old saying, suppose they gave a war and nobody came? Suppose they gave a test and nobody took it. They, there are no consequences when no one takes it. They can't punish everybody. They can't withdraw the funding. They can't do anything. Don't take the test. Don't give the test. And our third action item is do whatever you can to defend the legal rights of teachers who dissent. Restore free speech to educators. Thank, thank you. Buy a t-shirt. Happy travels home.